As we have been talking about this word called lordship, everybody say lordship. Answering this question, who is the Lord of your life? Who is the Lord of your soul? I love what Isaiah chapter 43 verse 10 says. It says, I am he. How many know that's just straight up gangster right there? Like we could drop the mic, we could close out service right now. Isaiah 43 says, I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. He's not just a savior, but he's also the Lord. I, I want to continue to break this idea down tonight, answering the question, are you the one? How many of you have ever watched the TV show, Are You <laughs> the One? I'm going to be honest, I've never watched that show before. Uh, but uh, just a little bit about me and my wife, our favorite thing to do as a couple is to watch really crappy reality dating TV shows. <laughs> Anybody else, you just love it. You just love it, right? They're all over Hulu. They're all over Netflix, right? They're, you can really, Peacock, right? They're, they're everywhere. You can find a really garbage TV show about people falling in love that will break up 30 minutes after they say I do. <laughs> you know, I, I love it, but... There's a TV show called Are You the One? And I, I want to ask you today, are you the one? Or who is the one? Who is the one in your life that is responsible for every good thing? I, I think that sometimes we can answer this question wrong and say, man, it's me. I did this. I built this. I'm self-made. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? I'm self-made. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I hate to burst your bubble, but no, you're not. Did you know that every single good thing that you have in your life comes from one person and one person only, and his name is Jesus Christ? <laughs> he's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. He's the one true God. He is the one. I love Isaiah 43 because he reminds us, hey, you're not the one. I'm the one. I'm the one responsible for waking you up this morning. I'm the one responsible for your job. I'm the one responsible for that relationship. I'm the one responsible for that raise. It was nothing that you did. It was not by works that any man should boast, but it was all because of me. It's because my grace is sufficient for you. It's because of my strength that is made perfect through your weakness. I am he, he says to us in Maybe you're here tonight feeling like, man, I, I, I feel like I, I'm self-made. I, I felt like I, I've been chasing this dream. And I, I just want to remind us who's in charge tonight. That's my goal is to remind us who is in charge tonight. It's this letter that Paul writes that we're going to be studying in uh, 1 Corinthians. Okay, I'm excited to preach tonight because tonight I am preaching out of my own personal devotional that God was speaking to me. Uh, have you ever read the Bible before and you're like, God, I, I don't know what... I need, but would you, I, I'm just going to flip open the page and hopefully something will be there. Anybody you ever done that before? That's exactly what I did on Monday. I was hitting a wall and I was like, God, I just need something for my life. I don't even know what I need. And he opened me up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and I started reading it and it was like the words of the page were coming alive and they were hitting me in the face. It was beautiful. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31 says this. I'm going to read it in a sarcastic manner in the way that I believe Paul was writing it to the Corinthians. And I'll break it down a little bit of why I believe that. It says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were noble at birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things of this world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The title of my message tonight, if you're writing notes, if you're not, then write this down also. I feel dumb. 
I feel dumb. Tap your neighbor right now and say, you look dumb. I've told you to say something offensive to your neighbor every week of this series. And today I want you to tell your neighbor, you look like a dummy. Jesus, we come before you tonight, God, and we ask that you would speak directly to us. God, we ask for a direct download from heaven. God, I pray that my voice would minimize, yours would maximize. God, we came into this room one way, looking a certain way, but I pray that when we leave this room, we would leave changed, transformed, never the same again, and looking just a little bit more like you. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen and amen. Come on, one more time. Can we clap it up for Jesus in this place? Um, fair warning, I'm not even going to lie to you, I'm tired tonight. Okay, uh, as soon as I get off stage, I'm going to bed, all right? And when I get tired, I get a little loopy, all right? I'm not like one of those guys that's like, oh, I'm just like tired. I kind of get a little crazy, okay? Uh, so uh, match my craziness with my tiredness, and it's just not a good mix, okay? So I don't know what's going to come out of this microphone, but I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit um, would open your heart to receive whatever comes out, amen? All right, that's my preface for tonight, all right? I feel dumb. Um... I love this letter that he's writing to the Corinthians, and there's a lot of rich history behind the church of Corinth. This is the church that he is writing this letter to, this church in Corinth. It's a well-established church. It's a well-known church. It's a church that is known around the world and around the region. It's why Paul is writing to this church in Corinth. However, this church had problems. How many know every church has problems? Okay, you will never walk into a perfect church. If you are here church shopping tonight, I hate to break it to you, but Impact Church, we have problems. It's because the church is ran by people, and how many know people are cray cray, and people have problems. And, and that's why this church is kind of crazy, and he's coming to this church, and he's trying to address some problems that this church has. He's, he's writing to address because uh, these people are Christians, but they're suing each each other okay I mean that's probably not the best way to go about business your brother or your sister in Christ and what he's trying to communicate he's like hey hey there's some there's some disunity happening here in this church we, we need to address this disunity not only that but uh, the door greeter was 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 sleeping with the maintenance guy <laughs> Okay, there, there were people in this church that were sleeping together, having an inappropriate relationship. And he's like, yo, this church is a little cray cray. Anybody thankful that Impact Church don't have those problems, right? We got problems, but at least they ain't those problems. Can I get an amen? <laughs> um, this church has problems, and he's, he's trying to address these problems. And these problems, they all stem out of this one issue, and it's spiritual superiority. Spiritual Superiority. In other words, there were these Christians that were saying, hey, I'm a better Christian than you. And there were these Christians that were saying, hey, I'm a better Christian than you. I know more word than you know. I know how to pray better than you pray. I know how to worship better. I I'm just a better Christian than you. Like, when you look at your life, it's like, bro, you can't even compare to my life. I'm just better. Right? If we are not careful, sometimes we will walk around with this halo of grace on our heads thinking, wow, I am a Christian. I am saved. I am sanctified. Wow, look at this dirty person over here. I can't believe that. Have you seen their problems? Have you seen what they're going through? And God is looking at you and he's saying, baby, you are just as ugly as them. <laughs> because the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. I, I invited some friends to church with me um, from a high school. And, and we have this youth group that me and my wife oversee. And so these uh, guys came into the church and there were some people, there were some girls who... Um, who also come to the church from that same high school. And when these guys came in, they were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the football players are here. You remember being in high school, feeling like that? You're like, oh my God, I, I can't believe that they're in the same room as me. Those guys are terrible people. And I was like, wow, thank God that they're in church then. <laughs> Because last time I checked, this wasn't a club for all the saints. This was a place for the broken, for the hurting, for the lost, for the hopeless. Come on, anybody thankful today that you didn't have to show up perfect to church today? Okay? 
Your eyeliner's a little crooked. It's okay. Okay? You, your armpits smell a little funny. Guess what? It's okay. All right? You dropped a little coffee on your t-shirt. It's okay. This is a place for all people where they can come and belong and find Jesus. Come on. Can somebody shout like you're glad that the church is a place for broken and perfect people. This is what he's saying. He's like, dude, you guys got it all wrong. You, you guys are fighting to be the most superior amongst the rest. Paul is addressing in verse 26 this because the church in Corinth, I love this. The church in Corinth, it was made up majority of lower class individuals. Most of them were former slaves. Okay? <laughs> Ain't it funny how so often we forget where we came from? <laughs> he, he's, talking, he's like, um, where did you get it twisted that y'all were trying to be super Christians? Y'all used to be slaves. <laughs> you guys are not smart. <laughs> y'all ain't got an education. You are not influential. Ain't nobody following you. And you weren't even born of nobility. Now, during the Roman Empire, it's so funny that Tyler made that joke because I almost made that joke. I was like, hey, any guys out here, when's the last time you thought of the Roman Empire? <laughs> But, but in the Roman Empire of this day, um, status was built not on wealth, but on noble birth. The family that you were born into, the name that you carried when you were born. But based on either criteria, these Corinthians are the last people that should be fighting over this spiritual superiority. And he looks at these guys and he's like, don't you forget that you're a bunch of dummies. <laughs> you know what the D in disciple stands for? Dummy. Dummy. <laughs> if you read your Bible enough to understand who the disciples were, Jesus for some reason liked hanging out with dummies. And Paul is writing to this church in Corinth saying, hey, hot stuff. Um, just a quick reality check for you. You're not that hot. <laughs> Everything that you think that you've been building on your own, it ain't because of you. You ain't self-made. You're Christ-made. You ain't self-formed. You're Christ-formed. You ain't self-breathed. You are Christ-breathed. What, what is this? It's a reality check. Why? Because we all need a good reality check sometimes. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You need a reality. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you need a reality check. <laughs> you, need a, you need a wake up call sometimes. We all need a wake up call sometimes. Anybody got younger sisters or older uh, siblings or younger siblings that like their life mission is to call you out. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's like that even, or her real hair, she got a weave on. It's like, it's like, bro, like what you talking about? Like leave me like, the, oh, his shoes, no, those shoes are fake. My mama bought him those. She bought those off Wiz. They ain't even real. It's like, dude, shut up. Shut, why have you made it your mission to call out everything inside of me? But the funny thing is, is, is we all, especially in our faith, need a reality check. Paul is like, bro, y'all are fakes. <laughs> you guys are phonies. Why are you guys acting like the spiritually elite when in reality you guys were born of the lowest rank and the lowest order? And yet they are casting this shadow. They are casting this facade. They are casting this image that they are greater than they actually are. Isn't it funny how... The shadows that we try to cast in our own lives. The images that we try to portray to other people. The issue with shadows, though, is that shadows are places that are absent of light. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, then you better get used to getting exposed by the light. <laughs> if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, then you better get ready 
and enjoy your time living in the spotlight. Why? Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, you are children of the light. And you're children of the day. We don't belong to the night. Nor do we belong to the darkness. I, I just think it's funny because we're not children of the darkness. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Anybody ever gone camping before? You ever gone camping before? Um, one of the camping essentials that you have to bring is a flashlight. Okay? Because if you've ever walked around in the wilderness, I'm not talking about glamping. I'm talking about camping. Okay? You ever been out in the boondies and you forgot your flashlight? And you're like, ooh, spooky. Ooh. And you hear the ruffling in the bush. And you're like, ah, it's a javelina. Ah, we're going to get eaten. Right? You, 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 ever, you ever experience, dude, living in the dark is scary. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, you are dying. That's why, listen, if you are hiding your sin today in the darkness, you think that you're helping yourself, you're actually killing yourself. I would much rather be exposed and everybody know than be killing myself. This ain't me, this is the Bible. You don't like it, don't read it. <laughs> this is what God's word says. Without vision, without the light, and this is why God doesn't just give you a light to hold in your hand. He gives you a light that is in your heart so when the devil tries to steal the things that are in your hand, he cannot steal the light that he has placed inside of your heart. So as for me and my house, I'm going to let it shine. Tap your neighbor and say, I'm going to let it shine. We used to sing a song in, in, in church. It went something like this. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Come on. If you were ever in Sunday school, you know the song. Come on. And then it went like this. And then it went like, I won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. I won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. I won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Come on. Somebody needs to get this in your spirit one more time. Come on. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Come on. We can have fun in church. Come on, somebody clap for Jesus right now. I'm going to let it shine, man. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it shine. I've got a light, man. I, I've, got, I've got a light that I can let shine. Matthew chapter 5, it says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven does your light have an on and off switch <laughs> can, we, can we be real <laughs> does your light shine in church does your light shine out of church does your light shine in traffic does your light shine? Apparently not. <laughs> Hold up. D does your light shine with your coworkers, with your boss, with your family? With Where is your light? How is your light shining? I love what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants them to do. I mean, we all have to come to our senses with God. There's a moment that all of us have had in this room. Maybe you haven't had it yet, but maybe tonight is your moment where 
It's like your eyes open. It's like your ears are wide. It's like your soul leaps out of your body because you have finally come to your... Do you remember the day that you finally came to your senses? Do you remember the day that you finally realized, holy smokes, dude, this was not me. This was all God. It was only God. It was only ever God. We all have to get to the place where we come to our senses and we have to realize that none of this was because of me. None of this was because of me. None of it. Somebody say none of it. it. See, that's why worship is so important. That's why we put such a high emphasis on worship and praise. That's why when we walk into the building, the first thing that we ever do is worship and praise. That's why any church or conference or gathering uh, of faith that you ever step into, you want to know the first thing every single time. I've been to so many churches. Every single church that I go to opens with worship and praise. Why, why, why do they do that? Because it's a reality check. It puts me in place before I even dig into the word. That's why I love worship. That's why you got to be careful of singing worship songs that have a lot of I and me in them. <laughs> be wary of worship that talks all about you. It's not about me. It's all about God. It's not about me. It's about what he did. It's not about what I did. It's about the cross. It's about how he saved me. It's about how he set me free. It's about how he put me on solid ground. This this is what worship does. What, what does. What does worship do? Worship reminds us of my position. And it puts God in his position. That's why you worship. You worship to lower yourself and exalt God. You worship to remind yourself and give yourself a reality check. Holy smokes, this was not me the whole time. It was always God. I'm here because God stepped in the gap when I was on the verge of destruction. I am here because when I was weak, he was strong. I'm here because when I didn't know the answer, he showed up and said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It, it, was, it was only him. It was, it was always him. It will forever be him. But you want to know why we struggle to worship a lot of times? It's because we're too high. Some of you, that's literal right now. <laughs> And if that's you, you're in the perfect place right now. (laughs) I'm so glad that you're here. (laughs) But even maybe not literally, metaphorically, you're too high. And you have positioned yourself way too high. (laughs) Dude, that's why I hate it, man. There ain't no judgment. I just hate it. When people get into an atmosphere of worship, and I was like, mm, gosh, I hate this song. <sighs> oh, dude, I hate this song. Whatever, though, whatever. I just, man. Oh, my gosh, dude. Dude, she does not sound that good. <laughs> I, I, I could probably sing better than her. I <laughs> just... Oh my gosh, dude. Worship is going forever. Bro, man. Why do they always got to do three songs? Why can't they just do half a song, man? It's just like, oh, man. Dude, I can't stand it. Because we, we roll up into an atmosphere that we don't belong in. We roll up into an atmosphere that we couldn't pay the price for. We roll up into an atmosphere that becomes so routine to us, 
But God is like, dude, if you would just wake up, the things I could do in your life, the things I could speak over your life, the things I could encounter in your life, if you would just stop making it about you and start making it about me. Where are the worshipers at? Let the worshipers arise. The Bible says if you don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. I don't know about you, but in the presence of the Lord, the rock ain't going to steal my praise. Is there anybody right now that can give God five seconds of uninterrupted praise? Not because a pastor is telling you, but because there's a God right now in this room that deserves it. He's worthy of it. I'm just trying to wake up some worshipers. That's it. I'm serious. I'm, ser I'm serious. I'm serious, dude. I'm ser I can't do it anymore. I can't do church anymore. I, I can't do it. I, I just, I can't, man. I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it about the, the lights and, man, if, if, if this is what it is and, and hey, hey, only if this preacher is preaching and, hey, only if this worship leader is leading. Hey, if only these things align. Dude, then the church ain't for you. In the most respectful way possible. The church is not for you. Why? Because the church is about God. And the church is about his presence. You don't like the message? That's fine. You don't like the worship? That's fine. You came for the wrong reason? I'm not here because I want to preach a good message. I'm not here because I want to hear a cool song. I'm here because I want to encounter the living God. And I want to be seen by God. And I want to be heard by God. It's not about you. It's just not. It's not. We do a real good job as, as the church of catering to people. And not catering to God. That's why, dude, I'm, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm so done, man. I'm, I'm done trying to cater to people because we don't show up for people. We show up for God, and God shows up for people. As long as I show up for God, God will do what he has to do. But I'm sorry, I can't save you, and I can't heal you. And I can't set you free. But I know a friend that I have in God that he can save you. He can set you free. He can give you a firm foundation. I feel dumb today. <laughs> I feel dumb. To be honest, I'm okay with that. Thanks, Armand. We can be dumb together, man. Listen, if, if you're going to worship the way God intended you to worship, then you're going to have to learn how to get low. Get low. You got to learn. Tap your neighbor and say, you got to get low. How, how many know that song? You sinner, you're a 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 sinner. <laughs> you gotta learn how to get low. This ain't rocket science. This ain't rocket science. This is not rocket science what I'm preaching to you today. I'm preaching to a bunch of dummies today, okay? So if you are amongst the spiritually elite, this service is not for you. Come back next week. We're going to talk about heaven and hell, okay? That's for the theologians. Today, it's for the dummies in the room, Okay? If you're worshiping too high, you got to get low. That's why God allows life to knock you down. Because it brings you to your knees. And it's only when God has you on your knees that he can say, man, that's the posture that I need you in. That's the posture that I can use. That's the posture that I can send. That's the posture that I can call. 
That's the posture that I can destine. It's only when I get on my knees before the Lord and realize, dude, it's not about me, that God can begin to use me. That's why I love hearing testimonies of people that are like, man, I, I was arrested before. Anybody here, you've ever been arrested before? Huh, about a 5-0, come on, somebody. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I, I love hearing testimonies of that. I, I love hearing testimonies of people that say, man, I used to be a drug addict. <laughs> Any drug addicts in the room? <laughs> former drug addicts, not current drug addicts. <laughs> I hope you're not current. Any uh, former alcoholics in the room? You like you used to go on crazy benders, okay? Anybody, anybody here, like, you were, uh, you used to sleep around a lot. <laughs> you used to, like, that was like that was your thing. That was, dude, like that that was your thing. That was that, like I, I, I love hearing I love hearing testimonies of people that came to their senses. I love hearing testimonies of, of the church, of people that were so broken and so bound and so <laughs> left for dead. And yet God showed up and he said, hey, are you ready for some freedom? Hey, are you ready for some salvation? Hey, are you ready to cast your sin on me? Are, 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 are you ready to be set? Are you ready to lay your life down at the foot of the cross? And are you ready to get low? So that I can elevate you. Because it's only when I'm in this position that God can elevate me. And some of you, you're so high and you're trying to get up here and you're like, man, God, use me. And God's like, dude, I can't use you until you posture yourself in a way that is no longer about your pride and your effort and your work. But it is through grace that you are saved. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love the story of David in the Bible. King David. King David has this dummy moment in his life. He recovers the Ark of the Covenant and he is elated with joy. Uncontrollable joy. So much joy that he rips off his robe. He exposes himself. And this brother starts dancing in the public streets. So crazy that his wife is looking out the window and she gets filled with anger. She gets filled with offense. She gets mad. She's like, I can't believe that this dude would do this. I can't believe, man, I can't believe that he's exposed. Man, why is he dead? Man, that's not God. I can't believe, I, I, just, I can't believe that this God, David, what are you doing? David, you shouldn't be doing it. David, that's not godly. David, David, stop that. David. And I love David's response. Real spicy. Second <laughs> Samuel chapter 6, verse 22 says this. In God's presence, I'll dance all I want to. He tells me over you and the rest of your family to be prince over God's people, over Israel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sister. I'll dance to God's glory. I love this. Even more recklessly than this. And as far as I'm concerned, I'll gladly look like a fool. Can you imagine David? <laughs> His wife sees and he's like, what are you doing? You look like an idiot. <laughs> and David's like, <laughs> I don't care. Because I ain't doing this for you. <laughs> I'll keep on dancing for God any day of the week. Why? Because he chose me and he didn't choose you. So if he's going to choose me, he gets all of me. Not just the cool, eloquent, sophisticated version. But the version that is unwound and unbound. The version that can't control what God, Christ has done in my life. That's the version that God is trying to get out of you. Some, some of you in this room, you are so sophisticated and stoic in the presence of the Lord. And that's great because God deserves your honor. But he also deserves your dancing. 
And he also deserves your unwound and your unbound praise to him to say, I don't care what I sound like. I don't care if I sound terrible. I don't care if I look terrible. I will dance. And I'm cool looking like a fool. I feel dumb. I feel dumb. Can I be honest with you? I feel dumb every time I get on this stage. You want to know why? Because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of preachers that are better than me. There's a whole lot of pe- preachers that can co- communicate a more theological and hermeneutically correct But a lot of times I just feel dumb. I get off stage and I'm like, wow, that sucked. <laughs> like, I tell my wife every single week, I'm like, hey, baby, was that even good? <laughs> because I just, I feel dumb sometimes. I, f- I feel dumb trying, trying to lead this movement. What? I, I've never done this before. <laughs> like... <laughs> Anybody, you ever done something that God told you to do and you're just like, I'll do it, but I feel dumb right now. (laughs) Like, anybody ever, like, God told you to do something, you're like, dude. (laughs) What? (laughs) Why am I tithing? I already don't have a lot of money. (laughs) Like... I could really use that 10% right now. I got bills. This feels, dude, I, I, gotta, I gotta make this decision. Pray about it. Okay. <laughs> what is prayer gonna do? <laughs> oh, it's gonna unlock doors. Like physical doors? Because I, I need a job now. <laughs> you know, like, like I'm, I'm about to be late on my rent. You know, like, hey. Break up with that person that you've been dating for. I've been dating for five years. They have, they have five years of my life. Five years of my life. You want me to break up with them? Like, I've invested so much time, energy, money, life. Dude, if I leave this, like, I just, I, I feel dumb. I, I, feel, I feel dumb. The other day, I opened up um, Instagram, and I got this book of this guy. And let me preface this. If you're in the room or you're watching this back on YouTube, God loves you. I love you. There's no animosity. But this guy wrote me a book about how terrible of a preacher I am. Okay? (laughs) He went as far as to say I was... Not a good father, the, the, the man of God that I am being on stage and conveying myself to my children, who I talk about all the time. He's like, man, how dare you wear hats in church? How dare you wear a V-neck to show off your little baby chest hairs? <laughs> how dare you talk like that and make jokes in church? This isn't comedy club. This is, this, and he's like, just like going, going. And he, go, he wrote me a book. It's like an encyclopedia. And, and this dude is just, he, he's just going and going, saying I'm disgracing God's house. And maybe you feel that way about me today. I just don't care. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to be one of those guys that's like, yeah, stick it to the man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. Just honestly, I don't care. Because my purpose is not to please. <laughs> Whether you're in the room or you're not in the room, Guess who's still going to be running back and forth on this stage, preaching till the lights shut down, screaming on a mic? I don't care. I 
I've just come to the place in my life. I'm not here to please a man. I'm here to please God. <laughs> so maybe you leave this room and you say, I don't like that message. You got to take that to God. <laughs> I am not responsible for pleasing you. I am not responsible for saving you. I am responsible for encouraging you and pointing you to Jesus. But if you never make it there, that's, that's on you. But as for me, I got to be okay with the tension of feeling dumb in my faith. I, I've, I, I have to deal with the tension of looking at the criticism and looking at the naysayers and looking at the haters and saying, yeah, I look dumb. But God knew what he was choosing when he selected me. God is not taken back when he sees the real you. <laughs> Can you imagine if God was like, oh my God, oh my God, what is he saying? Oh, somebody shut the microphone off. <laughs> Turn the broadcast. I, I don't know who this is. I, that, that's not the guy that I picked. That, that's not the one that I, that I spoke to. That, that, no, 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 no. Stop, please stop. Like David is dancing and he, he's all exposed. And he's not like, oh my, that's the king of Israel right now. That's the guy that's going to go down as one of the greatest kings that has ever ruled. No, no, no. God looks at you. And God looks at me. And you know what he says? I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. Come on, anybody thankful today that God is looking at your life? And he's not saying, ah, I don't know about this one. But he's saying, no, no, no. I know exactly what I'm getting into with this one. <laughs> this one's crazy. <laughs> this one's loose. <laughs> this one's broken. <laughs> this one's full of pain, full of trauma. But that's the one. That's the one I'm going to use. The, the disciples, are you kidding me? He comes up to a bunch of fishermen that can't catch fish. These dudes are professional fishermen, and they can't catch fish. And he strolls up, and he's like, hey, y'all, what's up, homies? And they're like, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. What y'all doing? Oh, we're fishing. Where's, where's the fish? Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys. Why don't you just, like, just come hang out with me? <laughs> and what do they do? They're like, Oh, okay, yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's follow you. Let's follow you for three years and watch what you do and just hang out. Let, let's leave our business. Let's leave our family. Let's leave our... Can I tell you, there is there's a piece of dumb that you have to play following Jesus. God, I don't know where we're going, <laughs> but let's bounce. <laughs> uh, do, do this. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Wait, go, go there. I, uh, I don't have the credentials to even get into that room. No, go there. Uh, no, all right. I'll, I'll step into the room. I feel, I feel dumb. And yet, that dumbness breeds this humility inside of me that realizes as long as I'm dumb in the presence of God, God can do exceedingly and abundantly more than anything I could ever ask, think, or imagine. That's why in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Notice he starts, if they will humble themselves. I don't want to be self-made. Because self-made means self-sustained. And I don't have the ability to sustain my life. Anybody in the room you can testify, you tried it. <laughs> you tried to sustain your life. You tried to hold your life in the balance. 
You tried to put your life on the scale and measure it just perfectly only to realize, wow, reality check, I can't do it. I need a savior. This, this reality check kicks in that, wow, I can't be the anchor for my soul. But I need a savior. Um, when I go to the ocean, I instinctually play this game. I don't have a name for it, so I'm just going to call it Stand Still. Where you go in the water, and believe it or not, you try to stand still. And if you've ever been in the ocean before, it's really difficult trying to stand still. While the waves are pushing you, and, and you're rocking back and forth, and you can't get your feet, and they're picking you up, and it doesn't matter how hard you try, you, you're, you're just, you're constantly moving, and you're constantly shaking, and you're constantly being tossed one direction or the other. Me and my wife, we lived in Miami for five years, and we lived right across the causeway of South Beach in the city, and so every time we would go to the beach, we would pass this causeway, and this causeway was connected to one of the major cruise ship ports. And so we would see these massive cruise ships taking off and returning and taking off and returning. And every single time I saw these cruise ships, I would think to myself, wow, how in the world does that go out to the middle of the ocean, the deep, dark ocean, the scary ocean? And how do they spend nights out on the ocean not getting off track, not getting tossed by these winds and these, the, the waves out in the ocean, the real ocean, they're way bigger than the waves that I, and I thought to myself, I was like, man, how, how do they do this? And it's because they have a really big anchor. And it's this anchor that drops hundreds of feet to the depths of the ocean and it drives itself into the ground. And somehow, some way, the boat ain't strong enough on its own. But when it is anchored in the right position and when it is anchored with enough strength, that boat ain't moving. You could be on a cruise ship. I've never been, but people tell me this all the time because I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm nervous about the motion sickness. They're like, dude, you don't even feel it on a cruise ship. You don't even feel it because it's so big, but it's also so anchored that, that you don't even feel the tossing and the turning that, that happens. I wonder how many of us in life are so phased by the winds and so phased by the waves for one simple reason, because Christ is not your anchor. Christ is your emblem, but he ain't your anchor. And when your life falls apart, you turn to the bank account. When your life falls apart, you turn to the group chat. When your life falls apart, you even turn to the church. And God is like, yo, those places ain't bad places, but I want to be the anchor of your soul. That's why it says in Psalm chapter 52, it says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. And I love the second part. It says he will never permit the righteous to be moved. Anybody thankful for that promise today? That when Christ is your anchor, he'll never let you be moved. It doesn't matter how strong it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how fortified it is. The righteous will not be moved. But for some reason, we don't like being tied down. I don't want to be tied down. I want to keep my options open. You don't want to be tied down until you're getting tossed around. You need an anchor. Who is your anchor? The Bible says in Hebrews 6, 19, it says we have this hope as an anchor for my soul, firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for my soul, firm and secure. I don't know why, but following Jesus, I feel dumb. And yet, I feel the most secure I've ever felt in my entire life. But you got to get to that place when it don't matter. No, God, it, it, God if my life is going to belong to anybody, it's going to belong to you. It ain't going to belong to my pride. It ain't going to belong to my job. It's not going to belong to that relationship. If my life is going to belong to anybody, it's going to belong to you. <laughs> Which means... Get ready to look like a fool. 
Get ready to look like a fool. When God tells you to go and everybody's like, bro, don't go. Bro, there ain't no money over there. What? There ain't no stability over there. What? That, that, doesn't, that literally doesn't make sense. You look like a fool pursuing that thing. Yeah. That's what I signed up for. <laughs> to look like David in the street. Living a life with so much reckless abandonment that I just don't care anymore. That's what I'm trying to convey to somebody in the room today. You care too much. You care too much about what people think about you. You care too much about what your future looks like. You care too much about all of the things that you shouldn't care anything about. The only thing that you should care about is who your life belongs to. Because as long as your life belongs to God, he will never steer you wrong. He will never let you down. He will never leave you. He will never forsake. Come on, is there anybody in the room today that knows what I'm talking about? That maybe you got a testimony that, man, you thought, oh my goodness, my life is going crazy. And then you found the anchor in Christ. I feel dumb. I I feel so dumb. I feel so dumb. I feel dumb ever making it about me. I feel dumb ever thinking that this salvation story was about me. I feel dumb thinking about the Bible was about me. You want to know what's funny? You got to be careful not to read through the theological lens of Narsa Jesus. Okay? You know what Narsa Jesus is? It's making the Bible about you. I am David. I will fight Goliath. I will pick up my stones and I will hurl them. You know, we get that story wrong. You are not David. I am not David. You know who we are? The Israelites on the sidelines. <laughs> Goliath! I can't fight him. He's too big. He's going to kill me. He's going to make me a slave. He's going to eat me for breakfast. I can't do it. And then David shows up. And David says, I'll fight Goliath. You know who David was? He was the foreshadow of Jesus. I am, I am the one. I am, I am the man that couldn't pick up his mat and walk into the house. That's me. That's me. Or are you the Pharisees that wouldn't let the person with the mat in? Because you weren't shining your light and your light was all about yourself, so you blocked the doorway for somebody else to get in. I'm not saying that's you. (laughs) But I know a lot of people that have so made the church and the gospel and salvation and his word about them when it has nothing to do with me. It's how I can stand on the stage and look like an idiot in front of 300 people and walk off the stage and say, man, half of them might not come back next week. But as long as one of them said, Jesus, I found you, then it's worth it to me. With every head bowed and every eye closed today, can we all stand to our feet today? Tonight is not about sophistication and looking the part. It's not about casting your shadow. It's about showing up to God saying, God, I'm broken. I'm useless. I'm hurting. I feel like a dummy. But I just want to be in your presence. Because there are new mercies here. There's new grace here. There's new salvation here. And maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus before. It will be the greatest and the dumbest thing that you will ever do in this life. To give your life into a being, into a God that you will not see on this side of eternity. To trust a voice that doesn't come from the flesh, but only comes from the spirit. To live a life that is contrary to maybe even the dreams and the desires and the pursuits that you've made for yourself. But maybe you're at that place to say, God, 
I'm ready to lay my life down and I'm ready to feel a little bit dumb so that you can use me, you can call me, you can set me free, you can put my life on a firm foundation and you can be the anchor of my soul. Because I'm tired of being tossed around by the winds and I'm tired of being tossed around by the waves and I'm tired of trying to make it about me. God, tonight it's no longer about me, but it's all about you. That's you today. On a count of three, I want you to raise your hand high and proud. If you're worried about people looking around, it's okay. Tonight is a good night to feel dumb. Tonight is a good night to make a dumb decision to say, God, no longer do I want to be in control. But you're in control. One, two, three. If that's you, you say, man, that's me. I want to give my, I want to surrender everything to you. I just want to know you and be known by you. In the mighty name of Jesus, right now I pray that you would be the anchor of our souls. God, that in our next storm of life and the many storms to come, though we feel the wind and we see the waves, we are not moved. Because tonight we put our trust in you, we put our hope in you, we put our lives in your hands, the way maker, the author, the finisher of our faith. And tonight, God, would you forgive us of our sins and call us into your presence? God, I pray for all of my friends today that are struggling in this area of feeling dumb. I just feel dumb. I feel dumb pursuing this thing. I feel dumb listening to the, I, 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 God, God I, I need something, but you're not giving me anything. Therefore, I feel dumb. If that's you today, would you raise your hand right now? I just want to pray for you. Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Almost half the room. God, I pray right now that the spirit of David would fall on them. God, I pray that the spirit of David, the same spirit that said, hey, if it's for God, I'm willing to look like a fool. I pray that that spirit would fall on them. Renew in them a new spirit today. To walk out of this room unashamed. To walk out of this room unhindered. To walk out of this room unrestrained. And to walk out of this room ready to live in reckless abandonment if it means living for you. God, we thank you that we can feel dumb in your presence. We thank you that we can dance like David danced in your presence. God, we thank you that we can wear hats in your presence. God, we thank you that we can show up broken in your presence. God, we thank you, God, that we don't have to have it all put together in your presence. God, I thank you that we can bring our unraveled mind to your presence. God, I thank you for your presence because better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere.